I am Captain Logan, and this is Day 216 of Spawn Year. Well, it looks like I won't be wearing that trash can lid today. Our culprit in this hackneyed little two-parter is indeed a crazed Jason Wynn, dethroned and plotting Spawn's demise from a back room in his bathrobe. Steve Niles makes Spawn stupid in order to perpetuate his entirely predictable mystery, and he expects his readers are stupid too. The only people reading this who wouldn't suspect Wynn immediately are new readers who don't know who Jason Wynn is, and it probably wouldn't be any more of a satisfying reveal for them either. Spawn gets a name out of Overkill's dying disembodied head, what an appropriate way to go after all the fun I had with that action figure, but it isn't Jason Wynn. He gives spawn the name of some general who facilitated Wynn's diversion of funds. We aren't told how Overkill knows about this general or why he's loyal enough to Win. he won't reveal his name, but unloyal enough he'll give spawn someone who can legitimately start his investigation and begin dropping the dominoes that will lead to Win. Ultimately, Wynn's plan is to get his revenge on spawn for ruining his career by framing him for murder. So I could see Overkill wanting to keep Wynn alive if he knew that and thought the plan would fail if Wynn was found out, but A, then he wouldn't tell Spawn anything anyway, considering he's almost dead and has nothing to lose but his retribution, see title for villain motivation, and B, Wynn is clearly manipulating Overkill and hasn't told him the master plan. Wynn knows how unkillable Spawn is, Overkill doesn't. So when Wynn sends Overkill to murder Spawn and tells him to massacre a shopping mall to draw Spawn out, he's really creating the mayhem Wynn wants to pin on Spawn. Wynn knows Overkill won't survive, but manipulates him into thinking he has a chance against Spawn, and he knows he'll do it because he shares Wynn's thirst for revenge. It's a very Jason Wynn plan. The only problem? Using Overkill should have been Spawn's first tip-off. That's who Wynn hired to kill Terry Fitzgerald back during that insane manhunt. Luckily for Wynn, Spawn can't remember his own history any better than McFarlane and Steve Niles, because he doesn't even speculate. He just scares the right people with his creepy green eyes and rattles chains until they lead him to Wynn. That's the other thing that sucks about being in this alley, by the way. Never in my life have I had the chance to be the least bit intimidating. Now I look like this, and there's no one around. So all Overkill had to do was say nothing, which would have made the most sense given his situation, and Spawn would have racked his immortal monkey brain and been as confused as Cleopatra with an iPhone. Once again, for the 80 bazillionth time, our hero wins by complete dumb luck. Wins equally moronic for using Overkill and not considering that if Spawn had half the wit of a Kmart bag, he'd have known who to go looking for right away, but even more baffling is how Wynn, in seclusion and helped only by a single ally as far as we know, has the resources or intel to find the remains of Overkill, much less put him back together. Isn't Overkill owned by the Roman mob? Even if Tony Twist somehow still had the remains, I don't know why he'd help a desperate and compromised win bring back the reason the Romans want him dead. And I'm just bringing Twist up because this story has disregarded everything else regarding Overkill from Curse of the Spawn. So Spawn finds Win and decides not to kill him, but to permanently scar his mind by making him think all his skin is burned off for the rest of his life classic poetic spawn justice. There's a lot of talk from Wynn about Simmons being burned alive, and how this is all about burning him again and making it stick. So it's an appropriate end for Wynn, if not rushed and really sloppily hobbled together. At the end, Spawn makes yet another dramatic status quo shaking vow. He is full of those lately. He decides to quit hiding, and the narration says, the hell spawn welcomes the world. He dares it. Bring it on. 
Well, he's felt entirely justified with everything he's done since his declaration of spawn dependence when he washed his hands of both sides of the celestial establishment. So besides the story necessity of the news not getting wind of his epic battle with Urizen, I'm not sure why he ever cared if people knew he existed any more than he did back when he wrote his own name in necroplasmic graffiti on alley walls. It sure makes all that stuff about Spawn being an urban legend and that writer who couldn't handle the truth feel less relevant, unless that's where this is going. Spawn making the truth about heaven and hell finally known to the public and society's reaction to that might be interesting. And I'd be impressed with McFarlane for being that bold after the lame way Urizen was concealed from public knowledge. This story is all about cleaning house. Loose ends are being neatly and hurriedly tied up because A, Spawn is way too powerful to be affected at all by his old enemies, and B, this wants to be an understated horror book now, not a flashy superhero thing. And frankly, that's maybe for the best with Angel Medina drawing right now. When people are just standing around, the detail on objects and faces and settings is fine, but the big action spreads are atrocious. Backgrounds are muddled or non-existent, the lines are sloppy, and I get that it's supposed to look like things are moving, but often it looks like a cacophony of color and shapes, hard to tell what exactly is happening. There's nothing here to reward readers for sticking it out, and reading all these issues of wind plotting and scheming. This read like an obligation rather than a thoughtful, heartfelt way to write out Al Simmons' greatest human nemesis. It's bad enough this series has so often been a chore to read, it's worse when you can tell it was a chore to write as well. Signed, Captain Logan.